begin this fourth session, fourth conference, preparing for confirmation with a simple little prayer in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Ghost. Amen. We ask Almighty God's guidance of the Holy Ghost on this Pentecost day that we may come to know this great sacrament and live in this truth of the sacrament. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, deliver us from evil. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost. Saint Joseph, pray for us in the name of the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost. Amen. The sacrament of confirmation, we said, gives you a character. What is that character, Ryan? Ah, grace is the friendship of Almighty God. Baptism gives you the character of a son. Confirmation gives you the character of a S-O-L-D-I-E-R, soldier. Okay, these are called steps in your progression towards a life of Christ, a spiritual life. So the spiritual life is eternal. It is not something that is simply for today and gone tomorrow. It's your eternal life. You are preparing your kingdom for all eternity here in this world. You either prepare a kingdom that is beautiful and loving and open to the mystery of God, or you follow the world. That's all there is to it. It's either I love the world or I love God. The world, the devil, and the flesh are one. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are one. And they testify the flesh is that which we know is the vehicle of our salvation, but the flesh must be, what? Disciplined, taught. That's what we said. The three stages for our own spiritual growth are, first of all, the mortification of my senses. Second, the denial of my heart. And third, the humbling of my intellect. Okay? Now... Who confers this sacrament? Any priest can confer this sacrament? No, it must be the bishop. Only in the stage of dying can a priest take and offer this sacrament for one who is dying. Okay? At that time, he may be given that permission. Okay? But the ordinary minister of the sacrament of confirmation, making you soldiers of Christ, is our general. And that is our bishop. In this case, Bishop Williamson will be officiating. He, as bishop, gives us this great grace of confirmation. Confirmation is a step in the process of becoming another Christ. The priest receives the fullness of this dignity when he is ordained a priest. The third step... So, character one, son. Character two, soldier. Character three, servant of the servants of God. And thus, we become united with Christ. So, confirmation is meant to perfect our eternal life. It is a means. I may use the means, or I may abuse the means. Right? I'm always the one who determines. So therefore, confirmation is directly attached to my will. I must will to be a soldier of Christ to be able to give my life to God in testimony to the truth that our Lord Jesus Christ has given to me through His life, death, and resurrection. Now, the Holy Bishop will say to each one of us, You must have a knowledge of your faith to be a soldier of Christ. The knowledge of our faith is the knowledge of the order that God intended in this world for the salvation of as many souls as possible. I'm going to give you the seven steps 
that are important for you to understand about the Catholic manner of living, that which is most important for the salvation of the greatest number of souls. I will wait. We want no distractions. The importance of our knowledge is that you and I can express our faith. What good is it if I come to confirmation and I cannot express to an individual what our faith is all about? The first step in the faith is this. I believe that God, the Father Almighty, in order to rebond my soul, which broke away from Him because of sin, in order to rebond that soul, He sent His only begotten Son into our flesh through the Virgin Mary in order to shed His blood to rebond me and to bring me back to the kingdom of God. And therefore, He formed a church, a mystical body, which has two powers. The supernatural power, in other words, it gives me eternal life through the sacraments, and a supranational power. In other words, God is over all His creation. A state is not over God. Christ is greater than culture. And this is what is being attacked. Every one of these things I tell you is being attacked today. So, the church, the mystical body of our Lord Jesus Christ is supernatural, giving me an eternal life, and supranational. It reigns over the world, whether the world accepts it or not. Okay? So that's the first stage in the salvation of souls. The formation of a church which is supernatural and supernational. Second stage. This church that God formed to reign over all societies has an indirect power. The indirect power of the per church is to claim the moral ascendancy of the Son of God. That I act in such a way that I say it conforms with the life of Christ. That is the moral standard for the Catholic and for all. Because the Son of God created everyone. We went through the nine stages of love of the divine, right? Three of the Father, three of the Son, and three of the Holy Ghost, right? We know those. Very important to have these understood. So now the indirect power of the church is that if there's a question about morality, should we kill children within the womb? Does the state have the right to say, yes, we can kill children within the womb? Women now have the right to kill? It goes contrary to the Seventh Commandment. Is it part and parcel of the state's power? What will you say? No. That's why you have to be soldiers. You have to be able to say to me, No, this is wrong. It's not part of the state's power to kill a child within the womb. Is it part of the state's power to change the gift of sacrament of marriage between man and woman and make it between man and man? Is it part of the state's power? No. The church has the indirect power to state what should be in the life of the individual in order for that individual to get to heaven. If the individual doesn't want to go to heaven, nothing we can say, right? You're going to live together and shack up? I can't stop you because God has made this universe a moral universe. You choose to love or you choose to go contrary to love. If you go, go contrary to love, you are going to end in what is known as that place which is contrary to God. Hell. Hell is nothing more than the absence of God. You don't want God in your life? God is not going to force Himself into your life. The indirect power of God, or the indirect power of the Holy Church, is to determine the manner in which you ought to live to attain the kingdom that you want to be in. You understand now why we're in such a battle? Okay? Third, 
We went from the church being formed as supernatural and supranational to the indirect power of the church, now to the first action of the church. Be fruitful, multiply. Form families. You know and I know that the primary purpose of marriage is to form a family and this family is meant to give children souls to God. And therefore, you and I know that we're going to have to battle for the truth that the family is the essential unit in which salvation comes to the soul. The way in which my mother and my father raised me. That's the key, right? That leads me to the fourth action. The fourth action in the order of God to save souls is that in the family, the father and the mother have the right to educate their children in the faith. Because faith is forever. And the children are not simply to be begotten as little monsters. They are meant to be little saints. And therefore, I must discipline these little saints to guide them in the pathway that leads to happiness in eternity. That's my responsibility, right? I'm not there simply to have the pleasure of the marital act and then forget about these kids. These kids must be led to the kingdom of heaven. And if mom and dad want to know what the barometer of their spiritual life is, they have only to look at what their children do. Are their children leading holy lives? Are they learning to pray? Are they respectful to one another? And so forth. So family leads to education. That's why the next step in my process of developing your family here is to have family spiritual direction, which is the next stage in our conferences, right? to have mom and dad and what we should do in order to have our children educated as Catholics and living a Catholic life within our family. Okay? So, again, number one, church formed by God, by His Son. That church is supernatural and supranational. That church has an indirect power. That indirect power is to guide the morals in my life. That indirect power leads me to say with the formation of the family. The family then must educate their children in that which Christ has given to us. The truth. The Ten Commandments and so forth. Okay, now, that's education. Now, two things that are not often thought about. The family, in educating their kid, must have property. Private property. You have a right to private property. And that private property gives you as a husband or you as a wife dignity. The church is not against private property, contrary to the socialist mentality that's going on that says big conglomerates take everything. That's wrong. Every individual has a right to be able to feed their family from the ground that they own. That's a truth. That's one of the parts of God's plan. Be fruitful and multiply, but you must now till the earth and create the food for your family. So property is a distinct right and it must be held as a Catholic. You hold to the truth that private property is a right. It's not something given to me and the state can come in and just take over whatever it wants. We have to fight for our rights, don't we? And so private property is that. Next is this. Money distribution. Every parent has a right to the funds necessary to raise their children as a good, solid citizen of heaven. No employer can simply say, well, you get this amount of money, whether, it help, whether you are able to use that to raise your children or not too bad. No. The employer must realize that this individual, following God's plan, God gave this individual 15 children. Well, that employer that employs this man has to realize this man has to feed 15 children. That employer maybe has five. 
He cannot apply is 5 to the 15. In other words, every child has this right from parent, and parent has a right from that who employs him to be able to feed that child and clothe that child and give that child a life in which that child comes to know, love, and serve God. So this is something that is very, very rarely spoken about. That finances are not determined by a socialism or a Marxism or a communism or a democracy. It's determined by God who wants to save your soul. Therefore, we must fight and reestablish Catholic action among men. Where men get together and say, this is the truth that we as Catholics live by, therefore we must fight for it within our society. Last. Everything is summed up from the church all the way down to the finances by one action that brings the Holy Trinity into our midst and guides us. It is the Holy Mass. That the reverence of the Holy Mass is lifted up and that this Holy Mass must be continued against all odds by Catholics who realize this Mass does not change. It is the sacrifice of our Lord Jesus Christ given to us Proclaimed in chapter 3, verse 21 of Genesis, by God the Father, who clothed the man and the woman in the skin of the Lamb. And now, that Lamb continues to offer Himself on our altar today, in an unbloody manner, but in a real manner. It's an eternal sacrifice that society requires for Satan to be crushed. And therefore, these are the seven steps planned by God for the easiest way for a soul to be saved. Are we clear on this? Okay. Now, Satan is the adversary. You are going to be soldiers of Christ, therefore you're going to have to fight someone, right? So we better know Satan. And that's why I save it to the end. Because the adversary is one who seeks to destroy. He is like a lamb or a lion seeking whom he may devour. In the 13th century, a king set up a particular law that ultimately all servants had to be honest and trustworthy. Any servant that he found doing anything that matched perhaps a stealing would be fed to the lions. That was the punishment, right? Well, this one gentleman uh, happened to take something that didn't belong to him but belonged to the king. The king not knowing the gentleman was always outstanding and everything else, condemned the man to the lions on a certain date. The people came, they were weeping for the man, they prayed for the man, and there the man was trembling because he had taken something that belonged to the king. He shouldn't have touched it, but he did. The king was there, he was ready to give the order for the gate to be lifted up, and the lions would be set free, and the man would be devoured. Everybody was praying and weeping, and all of a sudden, the thing opened up, and out came a lamb. And the people began to clap. Because the king had sentenced the man in justice, because he had taken something, and the justice was fulfilled, and mercy also came forth. And it's like that for us. We have been, in a certain sense, handed over because of sin, right? We all are guilty of sin. And we deserve punishment. And so God, in His justice, could let Satan tear us apart. Instead, what did He do? He sent a lamb. A lamb for slaughter. And that lamb gave His life. And that is why at the end of the book of Revelation, when they say, What is it? What is the power of Almighty God? All of a sudden you see a lamb slain from the beginning of time. This lamb slain is the Christ, the Son of God. And so Satan hates this lamb, hates this sacrifice, hates you, does not want your good, wants you to be fooled by the pleasures of the world, by the enticements that it gives you in this world, he wants you to be duped. The same thing that happened to me in regards to the Holy Mass when the Novus Ordo came in. We were duped. Tried, they deceived us because 
We did not understand what they were doing, what Satan was doing. So here Satan is. He takes the seven steps of God and he attacks. He has to first look at what God is doing before he can do anything because he's cold. So, uh, I would say, uh, God is creative. Satan is completely sterile. God loves, Satan hates. So, once Satan made the decision to reject God and His love and His plan, he became completely opposite of what God is. And therefore, he uses whatever God does in order to basically destroy that which is the soul. How does he do it? First step. He says that all religions are alike. The state should therefore let all religions do what they want to do, but there's a separation between church and state. It's a lie. Can a body exist without a soul? The soul of the state is the Catholic society, the Catholic Church. And therefore, to kill the Catholic Church is to kill society. And therefore, that's what Satan wants. Kill the society. And so, we are going to see America fold because it's built upon this separation of church and state. The Masonic principle is also the Satanic principle. Everything goes back to that one who we know as the devil, the deceiver. Okay? So, the seven steps, you can take the seven steps and say, what is happening in society? And it was amazing, but I took the seven steps and I looked at Brazil and what they did in Brazil and what's happening in Brazil right now, and you see the analysis of the government, it is the seven steps of Satan. Seven steps of Satan. And they're coming out and Brazil is falling apart. Everything that follows Satan's principles will automatically die. So, first... He wants to destroy the uniqueness of the Catholic religion and the Catholic Church. He wants to make every denomination a religion. I had talked to one of you the other day and I said religion is nothing more than religa, right? Rebonding. How many religions are there? One. One. There's only one religion. One religion, there's only one act of religion, there's only one virtue of religion. It is the act of God rebonding us to Himself through the sacrifice of His Son. That's it. There's only one act of religion. Nothing else rebonds us to God but the sacrifice of the Son. What does Satan do? Get rid of the sacrifice. Get rid of the notion that there's only one religion. Make it all the same. It's just like changing the word for a child, a baby in the womb. Call it a fetus, right? Confuse the issue, right? With language. Well, what do they do? Oh, there are many religions. No, there are not many religions. There's only one religion. There's only one act of God that binds us back to Him in His heart. And that is the act of His Son who sacrificed Himself for us. This is the beauty of our faith. It's so simple and so direct. Once you get into this nonsense of the world and the way in which it talks, well, then you get into confusion. Okay? So... First thing he does is destroy the uniqueness of the Catholic Church. If you make the Catholic Church one of the many, and Christ becomes one of the many, well then, you've got, everybody gets a choice, right? The other buzzword of today. Women must have a choice. They had a choice. They got pregnant. And they're going to give life to a child. That's a good choice. So, the other choice is devilish. Second, make the state dictate morality. You can kill your babies. That's dictating morality, is it not? Make the state dictate morality. In other words, eliminate the indirect power of the Catholic Church. Now we're dealing with the enemy. So we must realize that everything we hold for the salvation of souls, he's going to attack. And if you have the brain, you can look out there and say, it's happening here in America. Just like it happened in Brazil, it will happen here. Third, family, we said. What did Satan introduce to kill the Catholic family? Divorce. Divorce. 
indissolubility of marriage is now attacked. I don't care what they say. The fact is, all these divorcees are not divorced. They are still married. Before Almighty God, indissolubility of marriage remains. No matter what the government and what the courts say, it'll be a sad day for those who are divorced and go before Almighty God. But this is how you destroy the Catholic family. Divorce. Divorce sets you up for contraception because now what is most important is we're just happy together. That union of life is more important than what? Procreation. Right? That's what they're saying. Once that happened in Vatican II, then what happened in the, in the annulment cases? They jumped. Because there's no two persons compatible. I haven't found it. Very few do you find that... They, I find the ones that work and sacrifice and take the cross and follow the cross, somehow they are happy. But no two souls are compatible. You're too finite. This is what I'm teaching to young people getting married. You are too finite. You are limited. He is limited. You have faults and failings, negatives. And because you do have these, pretty soon you're going to see them and they repulse you from one another. How can you bring two negatives back together? Can anybody tell me that? What has to be in between the two negatives? A cross. A positive. Christ. That's why we say it takes three to get married. You have not been cheated because you find faults in each other. You're being challenged. You're being challenged to love the unlovable. I had to be challenged to love the unlovable when I was working with blacks in East L.A. or Richmond, California. I don't like what some of those kids learn and do. All right? But I had to learn to love and guide them along, right? In the Catholic way. So, families are being attacked. Divorce. Contraception. Abortion. It's all part and parcel of the Catholic framework now. Never used to be. I know when I was in down there in Laredo, Texas, I, how many Catholic women had had abortions and coming to confession. I just was blown away. Unbelievable. I, that have to be absolved by the bishop? No, it gave us permission to take care of it ourselves because there's so many. So we built an altar of the unborn and I would have them, these women, name their baby and put that baby into the, underneath the altar and we would have mass once a year for all those children. And those children should become the, for that mother, you know, her guardian angel. So that every day she prayed for that little one. We have to do whatever we can do to redeem that soul, right? So, but these are the things that we have seen happen within the Catholic Church that should never have taken place, but we were deceived. We're in a battle, and we forgot that Satan is active, always, 24 hours a day, right? We have to be aware of that. Third thing, fourth thing that he does, he took over the education of our kids. How many here have kids going to Protestant schools or public schools? And you know those public schools are not presenting them with the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we have an education that must be in the faith. So it would be better for us to take our kids out of the public schools and to begin teaching them our faith. You have only one book to teach them. The Bible. The Bible has everything in it. Science, literature, everything. How to read and write. Everything. It's the best educator in the world. You take and choose you know, what you have to do, but I'll tell you one thing. I don't have to go and get all kinds of books to teach kids. I just need one book, and from that one book, everything flows. And the child will become a thinker, a lover, a believer, and restore your faith in what I consider God's gift to us, the great gift of children. So education, that's what he's attacking. We have Common Core now, which now establishes that children should start learning about sexuality at age three, four, five. Nonsense. 
Don Bosco, in his education with kids, always said, you allow the child to remain as innocent as possible as long as possible. That's the best. Okay. So what did Satan try to do? With education, he went toward naturalism. The church is supernatural. Education of the church, supernatural, faith-oriented. Satan says, naturalism. What is naturalism? Don't worry about eternity. Get what you can in this world. Have you ever heard that? In other words, amass everything that will make you happy. Anything outside of this world, the fact that you're working, you don't need to mortify your senses. You don't need to discipline your heart. You don't need to humble your mind. You don't need any of that. You don't need to go through a purgative life. You don't need to go into a illuminative life or a unitive life. Forget it. The only thing that matters is, what do I have here and now? What's tangible? What can I see? Entertain me. Get it? So this is our education today. It's pure naturalism. And they will come to the point where they will say, oh, you have this talent, you will therefore study only these things. This is what we call the communist takeover, little by little. So that's what we're, we're, we're battling. Fifth, it is the usurpation of private property. Satan does not want you to own anything because if you are the ward of the state, the state can dictate to you what you do. Chips and everything else, right? Coming down the line, implanting them in people so that now we can control everything. We will have in the near future a cashless society. A society that says we have digital records of what you earn and that digital record will be what we take from to do bartering. And therefore, the state can control anything and everything about you. There's no, I can't take cash and just buy that. It's just gone. So, what has been happening has been the collection of land into the big farmer, right? Get rid of the little farmer, get rid of the little mom and pop stores, get rid of all those little things where people used to love one another and do little favors. Now it's cut and dry. Electronics and Best Buy. You know, you have all of these conglomerates, right? And they determine what their employees do. Because now, the employee, if you don't work on Sunday, you're fired. Right? Therefore, you're a slave. God said, keep holy the Lord's day. The world now says, every day is the same. Every day is the same. We have Corpus Christi procession. Well, used to be everything stopped for that particular procession because God is walking through the streets, our streets, and people would kneel down before Almighty God. Not now. I know we were in... Syracuse and we were walking the blacks were going what is that <laughs> I had a black and my student one of the students came into Salesian High in Richmond and there was a cross on our in front of the front of the room right normal thing right he comes in there and he goes to me who that who that <laughs> I said that's our Lord Jesus Christ that's the son of God what they do to him <laughs> you see this is what's happened. Uh, in Canada, they had a, an evaluation. What do the kids know more? Do they know Jesus Christ or Ronald McDonald? Guess who won? Ronald McDonald. The name of Jesus is nothing more than uh, a four-letter word used by most people now. You see? And that's why we say, you as confirmandi need to know your enemy and how he expresses himself. He's going contrary to the order that you know must exist for the salvation of most souls. All right, next one. He's taken over the money source. We said that. I guess you could put uh, property and money in the same category, uh, how satanic is working. He takes over the property, he takes over the money source, and therefore you become a slave. How did he do it? Well, he basically takes over conglomerates like Monsanto. 
And Monsanto then dictates, you have to have GMOs, right? And then here we are feeding ourselves and our kids poison. Poison corn, poison vegetables. And then the animals eat the poison corn, right? And we kill the animal, and what, what do you think we're going to get from a, a deer? So Satan is about death. He's not about life. And that's why everything that we said at the beginning for you, Confirmandi, was to give you life, eternal life. Now we're saying, here's who you're against. And he apparently looks like he is taking over everything. But he's on a leash, and that's where we have the faith that God will pull in that leash. The last is the Holy Mass. He got into the, into the Vatican II, underneath the Jew. The Jewish construct is right there. And I tell people, all you got to do is look. The idea of God changed in Vatican II. Do you believe like the Jew of today? Do you believe like the Muslims of today? Is that the same God that you worship? You have to say, no, Father, it's not the same God. There is a Catholic God. And that Catholic God is a trinity. And that Catholic God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, gave me the manner in which I might conquer the world, and that is the cross of Christ. Lift up the cross of Christ. When I am lifted up, I will draw all to myself. That's how we won. We hold on to this mass. We do not allow anybody to take it from us. And we are jealous of what God has given to us. Okay, so Satan is working in those seven areas. You understand those seven areas? You understand what your battle is as confirmandi, as adults. And the battle means that you're going to be spiritually perfected. You might even give up your head like these little fellows in China. Or the ones in St. Clement on that island who just kept coming and that man just couldn't believe it. And he just watched as head rolled. And there he was sending souls to heaven, making saints. More saints were made there than in Rome at that time. So where do you want to live? Is this world where you're, you want to put forever on this world or you want to get to heaven? You know, exact, each one of us makes that determination and we say, you know, what is my love determines my action. If I love God, I will keep His commandments as we heard today. And His commandments are not burdensome. They are that which bring me to the kingdom of heaven. I want to conclude now with these thoughts. First, the sacrament of confirmation establishes and enhances your dignity. It enhances your dignity. You are sons and daughters of God. Now you are soldiers fighting for the truth and seeking out souls. Every one of you can save a soul every day. All you need to do is make the sacrifice. Follow Our Lady's dictates from Fatima. Prayer and sacrifice. Secondly, it gives us, the sacrament gives us the grace. I told you that grace is the friendship with God. It gives you that grace, that friendship with God, so that you know that you have somebody with you. That's why St. Paul said, Greater is he who is within me than he who is in the world. That's the point. He's in me. He's going to do the battle. He's going to suffer in me. How did all those martyrs enable themselves? They didn't have the power. Little kids couldn't have the power. Women couldn't have the power. God had to come in, right? I, I could, I'd be... I just think about some of the things they endured, and I go, oh my God, I don't know what I would do. But I say, Lord, but for your strength, I'd be a failure in that. So it is with each one of us. We don't know. We do realize that we are of ourselves weak, but be in Him our weakness reaches a strength, a perfection in God. So that's what we require. So we have that battle with the world, the flesh, and the devil, and it is God who takes up the battle in us. What should we do then for proximate preparation for this gift of Almighty God? I'm going to give you four things to do. First, we should examine our consciences. 
Purify our hearts to be a fit dwelling place for the Holy Ghost. Make a confession. You'll have the opportunity to go to confession. Those of you who went today and made a good confession, keep pure. Keep yourself pure each and every day. But before you go and receive the sacrament of confirmation, you make a good confession and ask the Father, am I ready to receive? And the Father will say, yes, go forward, my son. Second, every day you should have a regular prayer time in silence to ponder all that God's Word presents to us concerning the sacrament. Meditate. Take your, your Bible, uh, of your Missal of today, and, and take the readings of today. Go there and you'll find Acts of the Apostles. You'll find St. John. You'll find St. James, St. Peter. You'll find the texts that deal with the Holy Ghost. But focus upon that in the next couple weeks. Focus upon the Scripture that teaches you about the Holy Spirit. Third, we should govern our tongues in the manner in which we speak and about what we speak. Great minds speak of ideals. Mediocre mind, things and events. Small minds, people. So listen to your tongue. Cleanse that tongue. Finally, the three elements that bring God's graces, prayer, fasting, almsgiving, are the greatest spiritual weapons and the means to draw down God's greatest blessings upon you. May each one of you use them in preparation for this great sacrament. Let us pray for one another that the Holy Ghost may find us willing to fight for our faith in these days and to die, if necessary, for the kingdom of God. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. Amen.